From CPRI and the CPRI Knowledge Hub, this is Research Minutes, a weekly look at new and important research in education. Today, in partnership with Phi Delta Cap and Magazine, we look at the concept of adaptive intelligence and how and whether schools are preparing students for real-world challenges later in life. The problem is, I ask you really, think about the differences between school problems as they're presented today in 2020 and real world problems. And the differences are stunning. We welcome renowned psychologist and Cornell University professor Robert Sternberg. Sternberg joined CPRI Executive Director Jonathan Sapovitz to discuss his new cap and article and forthcoming book on adaptive intelligence and how the concept has taken on a new level of importance following one of the most trying years in recent memory. I think that adaptive intelligence always has been important. What's changed is the ability of one species to destroy everything that's been built up before. The dinosaurs had the misfortune that, uh, you know, a meteorite lands and uh, boom, you're out of business. We don't need the meteorite. We're destroying our own world. That's right now on Research Minutes. Hello and welcome to Research Minutes. I'm Jonathan Sapovitz, the Executive Director of the Consortium for Policy Research and Education here at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. Today we welcome Robert Sternberg who's a professor of human development in the College of Human Ecology at Cornell University and an honorary professor of psychology at Heidelberg University in Germany, where he uh, must spend some of his time. So uh, Dr. Sternberg is, is known for many important contributions in psychology, including the triarchic theory of intelligence, where he theorizes that there are three types of intelligence, practical intelligence, or the ability to get along in different contexts, creative intelligence, the ability to come up with new ideas, and analytical intelligence, the ability to evaluate information and solve problems. And today we're going to discuss, I believe, what will be an extension of some of that groundbreaking work. Thanks so much for joining us today, Bob. Thanks you for having me, John. Today we're going to discuss, um, we're going to focus on a new article in Phi Delta Cap and Magazine entitled Rethinking What We Mean by Intelligence. And the article focuses on this concept of adaptive intelligence, which is distinct from what is often discussed as general intelligence. So, Bob, can you talk a little bit about what this concept of adaptive intelligence is? Sure. The interesting thing is that intelligence originally was defined by the pioneers in the field in terms of adaptation to the environment. That's how Alfred Binet, the creator of the first well-known intelligence test, defined it. That's how David Wexler defined it. Uh, His is probably the most widely used intelligence test in the world. So, oddly, those guys had the right idea. And then I believe somehow the field got lost. What they emphasized And what was emphasized in a 1921 symposium in the Journal of Educational Psychology, very simple. It's that intelligence is the ability to adapt to the environment, to make a go of things in the real world. And the reason I say that got lost is because if you look at intelligence tests and intelligence test proxies, Those are things like the SAT, the ACT, the GRE, tests that correlate as highly with intelligence tests as intelligence tests correlate with each other. What you find is that the kinds of items on them have very little to do with adaptation in the real world. Now, their proponents would say, well, that's okay because they show correlations with real-world behaviors. But what we're seeing today is a breakdown. Many of our leaders uh, in the United States and elsewhere went to 
good universities, prestigious universities, like the University of Pennsylvania, uh, to take a random one. Uh, they had high scores on standardized tests. They did well in school. And yet, in terms of where the environment is today, uh, dealing with a pandemic, dealing with global climate change, dealing with pollution, they're doing a really bad job. And so what I began to realize is that if intelligence is your ability broadly to adapt to the environment, we need to get back to that original idea and have a concept of intelligence whereby we select leaders who will be able to solve real problems, not just multiple choice problems on fairly trivial kinds of content that you'll never again encounter in your life. Bob, you know, thank you for illuminating that because it's so interesting. It makes me wonder about this irony that we have come to think of intelligence as this fixed concept, and you're challenging that with this notion that it's adaptive. How did we end up in this place with that seemingly incongruous distinction? Well, again, going back to Binet, which is kind of the beginning of the modern movement, he wanted to be able to distinguish kids who would do well in school f from kids who needed extra help, who needed special kinds of schooling. And that's a great idea. So he devises, along with Theodore Simon, a test, which in this country came to be called the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scales, because they were brought to the United States by Lewis Terman, who was at Stanford. And he devises a test that measures essentially academic skills, things like your vocabulary, your ability to do school math, your knowledge of the general kinds of abstract patterns that you deal with in school materials. And for his purposes, that made a lot of sense because he wanted to find the kids who would have trouble in school. The problem is, I ask you really, think about the differences between school problems as they're presented today in 2020, the end of 2020, and real world problems. And the differences are stunning. For example, test problems are multiple choice. Real world problems, they never give you multiple choices. They don't give you any choices that are very clear. Uh, school problems are well defined. They tell you exactly what the problem is. Real world problems, it's hard to figure out what the problem is. School problems have one correct answer usually, and it's either A, B, C, or D. Real world problems don't have one correct answer. They have answers that may be better or worse, but there's no one that's right on the target. Uh, school problems are emotionally unarousing. Who the heck cares really what the answer is other than you don't want to get it wrong? Real world problems are very emotionally arousing, and that often affects your reasoning processes when you try to solve them. School problems are usually for low stakes. Real world problems are often for very high stakes, like will I get sick and die from COVID-19. School problems uh, are usually solved individually, and it's cheating if you collaborate. Real world problems are usually solved collectively and have collective consequences. I could go on, and I actually do in the article, but my point is we went off on a tangent devising tests, standardized tests that measure your skill in solving problems that are nothing like the kinds of problems you need to solve in the real world. So in the Kappen article, you do a great job of both giving us some of the the distinctive qualities of adaptive intelligence and also giving us some scenarios of how we might assess for adaptive intelligence. And so I'm curious for educators who are going to be listening to this, how this might change the way that we think about what an educational experience is for students. I think schools do good, often great job given the constraints they're under. The constraints are unfortunate. Uh, we've had a series of administrations 
that bought into standardized tests and schools and teachers especially are under the gun to raise kids' performances on those scores. But the way we could and should be teaching in a way that I think ultimately would help kids for later life as well as on test is to give them problems that develop the kinds of skills that schools have always thought are important, but problems that are like those that they'll encounter in their lives. So a a simple example in the age of COVID-19 is what kinds of measures can all of us be taking both to prevent ourselves from getting sick and to prevent others? What kinds of things could policymakers do uh, at a local level, at a state level, at a national level to prevent the spread of this pretty horrible disease? Or, you know, we have, you know, you can feel the effects of climate change all over the United States and in the world. It's not only getting hotter, our storms are worse, parts are getting flooded. Louisiana, for example, has lost quite a bit of its land mass and constantly has hurricanes raging at it. So take some of the things like weather-related problems, problems of water pollution, where there's this huge garbage dump in the Pacific Ocean, microplastics, which we're constantly ingesting, and have kids apply their knowledge and reasoning skills to the kinds of problems that the world is facing today and that we'll need the future leaders of tomorrow to solve if we're going to continue to have a world that humans can inhabit. One of the things that I found really refreshing about reading the article in Fidelta Kappen was how practical your examples were in the kinds of things that we could indeed still use as assessments because I do think that in our education system, for a variety of reasons, we still want to have um, some sense of how kids are doing and whether the aspirations that we set forth in education systems are being realized. And so the examples that you give, give opportunities to still assess the intelligence, you call it, that are part of what could be a school experience for kids. Yeah, let's even go back to the COVID-19 example. One of the things we care about in science is that kids are good consumers of science, that they can recognize valid scientific claims from invalid ones. So give them... A little suspect today. uh, Yeah, it's a real problem today, especially when we have political leaders who are using a golden shovel to advance politics instead of medical uh, knowledge. So uh, show them a study of uh, a drug that can help prevent or that can help treat COVID-19 and ask them to evaluate the study. It could be a study of uh, one of the drugs that's being tooted now or have them design an experiment to test a drug or in uh, social studies Ask them about epidemiological measures that could be used that in terms of social policy would make sense, uh, not not only for COVID-19, but in terms of environmental preservation. The idea would be in you're coming up with a social policy to think about the different interests involved. Sure, there are commercial interests. Uh, But there are also conservation interests. There are the interests of people living in a certain area. So you would be developing the same skills that you're developing now to prepare kids for the kinds of tests we have now. But you'd substitute problems that are unengaging and that have very little to do with kids' lives with problems that you read about on the internet or in newspapers every single day and that have enormous consequences for the kids. And that's, you know, I have five kids. What motivates the kids is that the problems matter to them. And these are problems that all of us have to care about. This is um, certainly a a big thing about both student-centered instruction and trying to make 
school experiences, real life and real world for, for students. I'm curious about, you know, early in your career, you became very well known for these three kinds of intelligences, practical, creative, and analytic. And now you're talking about adaptive. What's the connection between your prior work and the work that you're speaking about today? Yeah, so some people kind of get into one thing and they stay with that theory forever. You've been adaptive? Yeah, well, I've tried. In the earliest incarnation of my theory, which came after my doctoral dissertation, I talked about information processing components. I thought what was wrong with IQ tests is that they measured these static abilities like spatial ability, verbal ability, numerical ability, and they didn't specify the elementary information processes that people actually use when they think. For example, if you give kids a vocabulary test, they said the problem with that is that not all kids have equal opportunities to learn those words. If you're, you know, English is only your second or third language, or if your parents aren't that well educated and mine weren't, or if uh, you go to a school that is not a good school, what looks like a lack of, say, verbal reasoning is actually just that you don't know what the words mean. So I said, let's start measuring the processes instead of just the results. I did that for a number of years, and then I concluded that I was making a mistake. And the mistake was that I was basing the information processing approach on IQ tests. I was using items from IQ tests. And I had I worked with three students who convinced me that that approach was wrong. Uh, one who I've called Alice was very good at taking tests. She had sky high numbers. She had great grades. She was a teacher's dream. Uh, and I was uh, I was a professor at Yale for a long time, and she came to Yale, and she was really good at taking courses and doing what professors told her to, but she had trouble coming up with her own ideas. Uh, and I realized that the one problem with existing tests is they don't measure what I came to call creative intelligence. They measure your ability to critique or analyze existing ideas, but not to come up with your own. And in life, you don't just sit down analyzing pencil and paper, computer-given problems. You have to come up with your own ideas. And then there was another student, Barbara, who was really great with coming up with her own ideas, but she didn't test well. And so I realized there's a distinction between the kind of analytical intelligence that Alice, that's not the, her real name, showed, and the kind of creative intelligence that Barbara showed. And Barbara was rejected by Yale. So I hired her. And as a research associate, she was terrific. She came up with all these great ideas. And a few years later, she got in. But my concern was that so many students are like that. They're really creative, but they don't get a chance because they don't test well. And then there was a third student, Celia, who wasn't as analytically strong and wasn't as creatively strong. And she was admitted, and I thought, well, you know, not everyone's going to be super analytical or super creative. But when she applied for jobs, she got everyone she applied for. I thought, wow, how did she do that? And I realized that she was someone who was high in practical intelligence. She could go into a job interview, figure out what they wanted to hear, and give it to them. So that was kind of the beginning of the triarchic theory, which you mentioned, analytical, creative, and practical skills. You know, someone has some of each of those. But then I realized that, you know, it's not just the abilities you have. People who are successful in their lives, people who are you know, great teachers or great principals or just great in their family, they're not just people who are good at all three. Rather, they're people who figure out what they're good in and then they capitalize on their strength. They really leverage their strengths. And what they're not good at, they figure that out, and they either correct it or compensate for it. And that became the theory of successful intelligence, that it's not just how much you, ability you have, it's how you leverage the pattern of abilities. So you don't even have to be that high ability if you can make the most of what you have. And then I realized that theory was inadequate 
because it was missing a really essential component. I began to see people who were analytically, creatively, and practically smart, you know, and they'd be very successful in the sense that have a nice house and a good car and a nice garden and live in a nice neighborhood, but at the expense of everyone else. Uh, you know, they were, the people were often making a mess of the world. And you can see that in, you know, some of the smartest people in our society are the ones who are creating the pollution and creating the conditions for global climate change. And they didn't care. And uh, they were using their practical intelligence the way a used car salesman might to sell stuff that he or she knows isn't very good. So I added wisdom to the theory, uh, which became the augmented theory of successful intelligence. What I realized is that it's not enough just to be analytically, creatively, and practically smart. The question is, are you using your skills in a wise way to achieve some kind of common good? So that became the argumented theory. But then I realized something more. And that is you could be analytically, creatively, practically smart and wise, but the world is falling apart. And what seemed to me more important than all of those is, are you directing your abilities to create a better world? Will you be able to say uh, in the latter part of your years that somehow you made a positive, meaningful, and maybe enduring difference to the world? And it may not be at a global level. It may be in your family. It may be in your community. It may be to teaching. It may be to administration or science but that somehow the world is a better place for your having been in it. And the reason that's so important is I began to look at, well, the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs lasted for millions of years. How long is humanity going to last at the rate we're going, at the rate we're destroying the world? You know, uh, many of the people listening to this are teachers or administrators. Our job is to create a world for the future, for the next generation, And what kind of world is my generation leaving the next generation? And so what I came to realize is that what really matters is creating a better world, which means adapting. And broadly speaking, that also means shaping the environment to make the environment better and sometimes selecting new environments when the environment you're in doesn't work for you. So that's how the theory evolved. Huh. Thank you for that that little tour de force. Um, I'm, I'm curious about in today's very uncertain world, um, you know, we're in the midst of the COVID pandemic, we've talked about environmental changes. And so I'm curious if you think that adaptive intelligence is more critical than ever today. I think that adaptive intelligence always has been important. What's changed is the ability of one species, and that's humanity, Homo sapiens, to destroy everything (laughs) that's been built up before. Uh, The dinosaurs had the misfortune that, uh, you know, a meteorite lands and uh, boom, you're out of business. That took millions of years, but it happened. Uh, We don't need the meteorite. Uh, We're destroying our own world. Now, to some people, when I started talking about this, they said, oh, you know, uh, Jeremiah, a doomsayer. But, you know, and then COVID came. And the only difference between COVID and global climate change is that with COVID, you see the results quickly. With global climate change, it's more like a slow burn. And what's amazing is that we have leaders who went to schools like yours and mine, top schools, and they're doing everything they can to destroy the environmental protections we need in order to leave a decent world to our kids and our grandkids. What is that about? If they went to Ivy League schools or even non-Ivy League schools, what exactly are they learning? If we're not creating a better world for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, what the heck are we doing? Yeah, yeah, they live in nice houses and gated communities. Is, has our society become so narcissistic that well, all we care about 
is what I've come to call a trans- a transactional giftedness. This is some of my latest work. And I think that's what's happened. Transactional giftedness means that we as a society are going to give you smart kids something. We're going to give you good grades. We're going to give you admissions to prestigious colleges and grad schools and med schools and law schools and business schools. We're going to give you entrance to top jobs at prestigious law firms and investment firms. We're going to do all that. And what we want in exchange for you is that you uh, validate our tests, that we can show that our SATs and ACTs predicted your success, which of course they do because we only give those best opportunities to the kids who do well on the test. I mean, these correlational studies are absolutely amazing because they show what a self-fulfilling prophecy can do. If you only give opportunities to people who score well, then you find the people who score well do great. If you only give opportunities to people who are white, you find that people who are white do great. If you only give opportunities to people who are tall, you find that they do well. So we create these correlations and then claim that somehow they're nature. But the reason it's so important today is that we have unprecedented ability to destroy the world. One guy, the president of the United States, can launch missiles that essentially will blow us apart. And it doesn't just take the one guy. Uh, If you look at the various kinds of things we can do in terms of destroying the environment and destroying our, not only the environment, our social system, we have totally untenable levels. Everyone knows it, of income disparity. The rich are getting much richer, even in COVID, they've found a way to capitalize on that. The poor are getting poorer, the poor are getting sicker. How long do you think that's going to last before the people at the bottom realize that they've been had, that what was supposed to be a meritocracy is just the spread of privilege from one generation to another. You, you, it used to be called socioeconomic status. You can call it test scores. They're not quite the same, but they're highly correlated. At some point, we have to start looking after people who haven't had the opportunities. And that's where I think adaptive intelligence comes in. If what, no matter what your IQ, no matter what your SATs or your ACTs, or your, whether you went to Harvard and Yale or whoopsie doodle state, if what you're doing is to contributing to the world's problems rather than help solving them, then I think, how much do we really care about your IQ? What we should care about is your adaptive intelligence. And that is you are making the world worse for everybody else to satisfy your own narcissistic ambitions. So I, I can clearly see in in the Kappen piece, and I'm looking forward to reading your book, which is coming out in February of 2021, and we'll talk about that in a second. But I can clearly see that you believe that adaptive intelligence can be fostered and developed in students. And I'm, I'm curious about the how you think of it changing the dynamic between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. I think that both kinds of motivation are important. You know, as I said, I have five kids and I've taught students for many years at a variety of universities. Extrinsic motivation sometimes helps kids get through things they might not otherwise want to do. And intrinsic motivation is really important because I study creativity. And if there's one finding that comes out again and again, it's that people are creative only if they're really excited about what they're doing. So, you know, I started studying testing and human abilities when I was 13. And uh, my interest has continued from that time onward. So, you know, having intrinsic motivation is super important. But where I think we have to guide students is in terms of intrinsic motivation for what? And that's where I think we've gone wrong. We've looked at intelligence in terms of like the processes of a computer. Can we make a computer that's faster? Or can we make one that has more CPU, has more power? And we've been negligent in asking about the programming in terms of the goals of that computer. And what I'm arguing for in adaptive intelligence 
is we let go of the notion that what really matters is how fast you think or how much CPU power you have. Sure, that matters some. But if it's for a bad purpose, then what good is it? Uh, if, you know, if you had the uh, super evil school of uh, uh, badness and you admit kids by their IQs or their SATs or their ACTs, and then uh, their first problem is to devise kind of bacteria that is totally destructive and for which there's no antidote. And they use their super high IQs to develop this bacteria and they let it go and everyone gets this disease and they die. Were they smart? Well, according to our traditional notion, yeah, they were smart. I mean, they had high IQs and they were able to devise a bacterium that no one else could think of. And they were even practically smart. They figured how to diffuse it into the whole world. But in terms of adaptive intelligence, this is obviously an extreme example, but it's not that extreme. In terms of adaptive intelligence, they were at the bottom because they destroyed humanity. And much of what we're doing today, I think, comes pretty close to that, that we, we may not have the super evil school of biological terrorism, but we have people who just who, who care more about getting elected or about having adoring fans or whatever they care about, then what can we do to make a better world? And that's where, that's where I think schools need to focus on what are you using your intrinsic and extrinsic motivation for? There are lots of good things you can use it for, but I'm afraid that education has been a little bit it's it's become very postmodernist. Well, you know, it's all it's all relative and you know, maybe there's some good in polluting the world. You know, it helps corporate profits. We need to look at the common good over the long term, not just the short term, and direct people's intrinsic and extrinsic motivations toward doing good for the world, not just themselves. Well, this has been a really fascinating discussion. And for those of you who want to stretch your minds further, I encourage you to go read Bob's full article. It's titled, Rethinking What We Mean by Intelligence, and you can find it right now at kappanonline.org or in the November 2020 issue of Phi Delta Kappan magazine. And you can also learn more about the topic in Bob's forthcoming book called Adaptive Intelligence, set for publication in February 2021. Bob Sternberg, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRI Knowledge Hub. To learn more about today's topic, pick up the November 2020 issue of Phi Delta Kappa Magazine, titled What is a Good School? Now available in print and online at kappanonline.org. For more episodes of this podcast or to subscribe to the series, you can find us at researchminutes.org. To share thoughts on today's episode or to suggest a future topic, you can follow us on Twitter at CPRE Hub. That's C P R E Hub.